One of the perks of being president of APS is that you get to organize a presidential symposium. It doesn't quite make up for having to talk in front of 1,000 people three nights in a row, but it helps. <laughs> um, so I, you get to pick the people, you get to pick the topic. It was a great pleasure to organize this presidential symposium because it's on a topic that I'm passionate about and I think is of broad relevance not only to developmental scientists, but to people in a variety of areas of psychology. I picked a group of scientists who I admire and are diverse in terms of their training and the t their foci of study. They represent the best of the cohorts that's kind of upper mid career, meaning about 10 years younger than me, and <laughs> Uh, and just past early, very early career. And these are folks that are building on the work of uh, people like Mike Posner and Mary Rothbard, some of the work discussed last night. I believe the research and ideas in this, that the group will discuss tonight illustrate both the critical importance of regulatory processes to human functioning, and also the importance of considering developmental processes when studying regulation. Our first speaker tonight is Clancy Blair from the Department of Applied Psychology at New York University. Clancy's research focuses on how children develop executive function and how, this develop, uh, how executive function is tied to school readiness and achievement in young children. He studied history at McGill University before moving to University of Alabama to complete his postgraduate work, which included master's and PhD in psychology, but also a master's of public health with a focus on maternal and child health. Clancy is currently one of the key movers in a large longitudinal study funded by the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development, begun in 2002, which is investigating the link between early life biological and environmental experiences in the development of executive function and self-regulation. By analyzing children's saliva samples for a biomarker of stress, he's been able to parse out relationships among poverty, caregiving, stress, and cognitive ability. Through this research, Clancy has found that parents in poverty are less likely to, to enact positive parenting behavior and this reduced level of positive parenting is associated with an increase in child cortisol levels. Increased stress in young children uh, is in turn associated with lower levels of cognitive functioning, indicating that the lack of positive parenting may be at least partially mediating the effects of stress on cognitive abilities. Clancy's applied these findings in his work and developing and evaluating curricula for young children in programs like Head Start that target the promotion of executive functioning. The hope of this research is um, to facilitate or foster better uh, self-regulation that will help children to cognitively um, do better cognitively and achieve um, higher grades and better outcomes in school as well as social development. Please join me in wel welcoming Clancy Blair. Thank you so much for that introduction. And thank you so much for the opportunity to present in this symposium and to speak with you about my research on self-regulation. Uh, I'm deeply appreciative of this opportunity. Um, I wanna present a model of self-regulation uh, and consider some of its implications for development. Um, and then sort of interrogate that model uh, with data from a longitudinal sample that Nancy mentioned uh, that my collaborators and I have been uh, conducting and with results from an education experiment as well. So with that, uh, now for anyone with more than a passing familiarity with uh, research on self-regulation in children and adults, you know that they're, we're confronted with a variety of terms, constructs, definitions that seem to define this phenomenon of self-regulation. And it's natural to wonder to what extent are these really terms for the same thing? Are they synonymous? Or are they terms for different things? Or are they kind of overlapping or not really overlapping very much? And to tell you the truth, I have no idea. 
uh, although I'm an expert in this area. But I do think it makes sense to begin to group these in particular domains, to think about the more cognitive aspects of self-regulation, to think about the more emotional reward sensitivity-based aspects of self-regulation, to think more about the personality temperament uh, manifestations of self-regulation, and to think about the ways in which these different domains work together in a system of self-regulation. Uh, a system that's characterized by recursive processes, that's both top-down and bottom-up. That is, whereas we know we can use executive functions to regulate attention, to regulate emotion, to regulate physiologically, by that same token, we know that as experiences registered physiologically, emotionally, and more automatic, less volitional processes, that's gonna have implications for our ability to control our attention when needed, and to engage the executive functions. It could facilitate it, but it can also really undercut it, uh, which is more phenomenal, uh, more familiar to us as the stress uh, phenomenon. I think there's some advantages to thinking about self-regulation in this way. Um, one is it allows for sort of ready incorporation of a genetic level of analysis. We know that we differ in a bottom-up perspective in variants of genes that are associated with sensitivity to catecholamines and glucocorticoids that are uh, expressed in the stress response. And as well, it incorporates a sort of an epigenetic process, both top down and bottom up, with the emphasis on circulating levels of glucocorticoids and the ways in which these levels may influence processes of gene expression and epigenesis. Uh, as well, I think it's valuable to think about this model because it's well grounded in a, in a tradition uh, in cybernetic theory going back 60 or more years in which we think of these biological systems as a system that is self-regulating, that it's gonna be adaptive in response to the context in which it's situated. And then finally, I really like this model or thinking about self-regulation because it has kind of an amazing neurobiology behind it. Uh, we know that as experience is registered rapidly, I'm trying to find the cursor. Oh, here it is, <laughs> thank you. Uh, as experience is registered rapidly in midbrain and limbic structures, uh, and the production of catecholamines and glucocorticoids, they feed forward, whoops, whoops, I gotta go back. Ah, rats. Sorry, guys. Ah, I gotta be careful with this mouse. So here, let me use this one. As they feed forward to prefrontal cortex, they are um, uh, um, uh, potentiating synaptic activity in prefrontal cortex uh, and feeding back on this system, this loop, to sort of optimize levels of arousal and attention, as if it's, you know, we're saying, hey, stimulation's occurring, pay attention, be goal-directed, and the ideas behind this system is that the catecholamine levels actually function literally in an inverted U-shaped fashion, potentiating activity, neural activity and prefrontal cortex associated with executive functions, and uh, as measured behaviorally by working memory tasks, by inhibitory control tasks, by attention shifting tasks. But as, it, as catecholamines and glucocorticoids rise beyond an, an, an intermediate level, um, they begin to shut down activity in prefrontal cortex, in the seat of executive functions and the volitional control of attention. Um, and as they rise further and further, indicating that the organism is under stress uh, and a little freaked out, uh, we see the sort of loss of this top-down prefrontal control and an increase in more reactive, less volitional responses to stimulation. And of course, this research is the research of Amy Arnston at Yale University and well-established through pharmacology and through uh, single-unit physiology in non-human primates. But it's very helpful to me in sort of providing a basis for understanding self-regulation as a system, and then beginning to consider some of the implications for development. If self-regulation is working in this way, how would we begin to study the development of higher order executive function abilities in early childhood and the volitional regulation of behavior and the vo volitional regulation of attention? Well, we would focus on reactivity and regulation of the lower level systems early in development. They're in advance of, presumably, development in the uh, uh, higher order systems. And we would uh, look there for the extent to which activity there is predictive of later executive function development. As well, it really helps sharpen our focus on 
experience in early childhood in terms of individual differences in the sort of parenting that children receive, as well as their early care experiences outside of the home, with the idea that the early care experiences are shaping this self-regulation system. They're influencing the development of this neural network that's important for the regulation of behavior and uh, brain development. And through that are shaping sort of a more reactive versus a more reflective phenotype. That's the theory behind this model. And the idea, it's a theory based in a psychobiological principle uh, referred to as experiential canalization, uh, forwarded by Gilbert Gottlieb, uh, one of my mentors and spiritual advisors, on the way in which environment and biology combine to shape development in ways that are appropriate for the context in which development's occurring, right? So this canalization process is a characteristic of biological, psychobiological systems. And my colleague, Sibel Raver, at NYU and I have really thought about the extent to which this characterizes self-regulation development in children, this appropriate development within context and highly disadvantaged context, a more reactive phenotype and highly supportive context, a more advantageous phenotype in terms of reflection. But really, the questions have to do with the extent of developmental malleability in this system. To what extent, when children are moving from an advantageous to a disadvantaged, disadvantageous context, or from a disadvantageous to a more hopeful advantageous context, are we seeing changes in self-regulation in the systems where we would expect them? So we've been interrogating this model uh, with longitudinal data from the sample that uh, Nancy mentioned, the Family Life Project. This is a wonderful study. It's a longitudinal population-based sample of children and families followed from birth really in, in and around small towns in rural Pennsylvania and rural North Carolina. It's a joint project with my colleagues at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and Penn State University. In its first two rounds, it was funded as a program project by NICHD, <clears throat> and the projects were focused on family ecology, parenting, work family relations, language development, and of course, self-regulation. And it has data collection in the home at these time points with follow-up through the second grade. And I'm happy to say we recently just got funded to follow the sample into early adolescence, finally. Uh, and I'm also happy to say that the first phase of the data collection are now publicly available up through 36 months. So if you're interested in this data set and in longitudinal analysis, by all means go to the ICPSR with this accession number and download the data sets. Um, and you can even check some of the stuff that I'm going to talk to you about today, if you're interested in sort of checking my work. So what I'm going to focus on is really parenting, and parenting sensitivity is the thing that we're most interested in here in the Family Life Project. So we're collecting that in a structured free play interaction. We're collecting saliva from children in infancy and the toddler periods. We're collecting that saliva both at baseline, adjusted for the time of day, and looking at the stress hormone, the glucocorticoid hormone cortisol as an indicator of activity in the physiological system. And we're also collecting it in response to emotion challenge. So a toy removal task and a scary mask presentation. And we're looking at relations of parenting and child physiology, both at baseline and in response to the task and emotional reactivity and emotional regulation that are coded second by second in response to these tasks. And we're relating those to measures of executive function with these types of tasks uh, that we developed for longitudinal use. Uh, and so just to recap really quickly, we're getting cortisol from saliva at these time points at baseline and in response to emotion tasks. We're looking at parenting observed in a structured free play, measures of risk in the home, risk in the household, and then executive function as children enter preschool. Right? And here, just a, a first analysis, looking at just the basal samples of cortisol collected, uh, assayed from saliva samples collected at baseline. And what we're seeing here is a, an expected or typical decline. I don't think we really had had data like this before from infancy up through the toddler period. For children in the dark line in more stable, less chaotic homes, but here for children in more chaotic, less stable homes, 
We're not seeing that decline. It's as if the cortisol levels are elevated and staying elevated, and thereby being less flexible in response to experience. The uh, analogy would be sort of like a home in which the thermostat's not working well, but there's going to be uh, unpredictable severe cold out. So you might just turn the heat on and leave it on. The house may burn down or become damaged in some other way, but it will predict, it will protect against that unpredictable severe cold. However, in a, a home in which the thermostat's working well, it will be flexibly regulated in response to the outside temperature. Right? So that flexible regulation, we think, is really being driven by maternal stimulation and maternal sensitivity. So we then looked at the cortisol in response to the emotion challenge, and what we found is at seven months of age, the, highly, the children experiencing more sensitive care as measured by that free play interaction were showing an expected increase and decrease in response to the emotion challenge. Here's the idea is that the physiology and the behavior are going along. The children in the dashed line experiencing the less sensitive care in the more chaotic homes, they're just as emotionally aroused by the tasks, but the physiology and the behavior are less well coordinated. So the idea here is that maternal behavior Early caregiving behavior is organizing the systems early on to work together rather than individually. And then we follow the sample forward to, to uh, 15 months of age and follow the sample forward to 24 months of age and see similar sorts of patterns. In particular, at 24 months of age, this is the third time that children have seen these tasks. And some of them are still uh, emotionally aroused by them and some are not. And what we see is high levels of maternal sensitivity are associated with high levels of cortisol when children are exhibiting a, an emotional response. However, when they're not, cortisol levels are low overall. So again, this idea of a coordination of the physiology and the uh, behavior in the context of, of high quality care. Um, and then, of course, we have this measured longitudinally so we can begin to ask interesting questions about change in maternal sensitivity because it is changeable and can change. Uh, so the, looking at this change in behavior and looking at change in cortisol was what uh, my, at the time, postdoc Dan Barry decided to do. Dan's now an assistant professor at the University of Illinois, but he had this brilliant idea. Would we see, if we see within-person changes and maternal sensitivity within mom changes in maternal sensitivity when we see within kid changes in cortisol. And of course we do. Uh, and it's this dark bar here. And the really fascinating thing about this analysis is it's in the lower levels of sensitive parenting that we see the big effect of change. That is moms who are initially low in their sensitivity and increase their sensitivity over time are having a big effect on children's cortisol levels, which is Good news, right, in many ways, and exactly what we would want to see. And of course, important, because what we see is that the positive, this more sensitive parenting and cortisol levels are predicting executive function at age three, the first time point when we're able to measure executive function, right? It's mediating some of the risk characteristics in the home through parenting, through cortisol, to executive function uh, in support of this model of self-regulation and self-regulation development. So of course, I've been talking about sort of baseline low levels of cortisol, but also the flexible regulation of cortisol. So which is it, Clancy? You can't have it both ways. Well, you kind of can. So we then, based on that, we hypothesize that moderate variability in cortisol levels in early childhood around a low average mean would be associated with the highest levels of executive function at school entry, if you follow me on that. And that's kind of exactly what we found there with this. So I think there are several implications of thinking about self-regulation in this way <clears throat> uh, and uh, uh, fostering uh, child development, particularly for, for families in poverty. And the idea that maternal sensitivity parenting behavior is changeable. Um, and uh, as part of the, the work in my lab and uh, shared with Sabelle Raver and our labs jointly. We're part of a group uh, that is a consortium of six uh, universities around a buffering toxic stress consortium. Um, these are funded by the Administration for Children and Families, uh, who oversees the Early Head Start program. And our goals in this really are kind of validation of the relations among parenting and poverty, stress physiology, 
and child outcomes, but also mom outcomes, mom self-regulation, uh, and looking at influences of mother self-regulation on child self-regulation, a mechanism of intergenerational transmission, looking at the potential for implementing a high quality parenting program through the early Head Start home visit, and conducting an experimental evaluation of that. So simple tasks like that. Uh, we're, we're getting through this study now, and we'll have data, I think, soon from the consortium on the viability of doing these, these things and the potential for high-quality parenting support as a focus for uh, uh, the types of services uh, that are being provided by ACF. And then I think there are also some important implications for education I just want to wrap up with. Uh, this thinking about self-regulation in this way as a psychobiological model, it's one manifestation of this sometime uneasy relationship between neuroscience and education. The idea that what we know about the neurobiology of the brain and brain development can really inform educational practice, uh, can help us answer the question of what we should do and how we should do it <clears throat> and what we should measure. And I kind of think of this as an early education version of working memory training, if you're familiar with the working memory training literature. That literature, Torkel, Klingberg, Susan Yege, have shown that the brain is plastic even into adulthood, right? When, when young adults do repetitive practice on working memory tasks, they get better at the tasks, and we see concomitant changes in the neural networks that underlie this behavior. The problem is, very little of that generalizes to anything that we're really interested in. If you want to get better at working memory tasks, you can do it. So in education, we can build on this, but let's embed the tasks, the working memory tasks, in things that we want children to do, where we want them to generalize. So what would that look like in terms of education? Well, it would look like reflection on experience, planning, self-direction, even in three, four, five-year-olds. Um, that would be a great way to, to try to embed self-regulation um, in, in children's development and their early educational experience. So rather than have to invent the wheel, I found a program, there are probably several programs that do this, but one that really makes this the explicit focus of its pedagogy is tools of the mind. And there's a pre-kindergarten version of tools and there's a kindergarten version of tools, and I don't have time to go into it because I'm just about out of time. Um, but uh, there's lots of information on tools of mind on the web if you're interested in this. But the bottom line is we conducted a randomized controlled trial of the kindergarten version with this many school districts, that many schools, that many classrooms, and that many kids. And importantly, schools range from 3% very advantaged schools to very disadvantaged schools in terms of free and reduced lunch. We had uh, measures of ex executive function, control of attention, speed of information processing, academic outcomes, and of course, cortisol. And what we really found in the sample overall is not much to write home about. There were small effects. So um, you can think of a standard deviation as about a year of growth. So in the sample overall, we saw mm, small effects on working memory, executive function, reaction time, a little bit on math and a little bit on reading. But when we looked in the high poverty school, that's when we really got the eye-popping results, right? And there we saw pretty big, about on average, a half standard deviation effect in these high poverty schools for this very focused program on self-regulation development. So looking at, across these outcomes, uh, including reasoning and vocabulary. So a, a very interesting and provocative set of findings, I think there are really relatively few evaluations like this. This educational research is hard to do, but we were able to follow the sample forward into the first grade and found effects on growth in reading and growth in vocabulary. So with that, I have to stop. I'm out of time. I would love to talk with you more. Um, take home message from this talk is let's, as much as possible, make our scientific understanding of self-regulation and the neurobiology of self-regulation inform what we do how we do it, and what we're measuring in terms of the outcome. So with that, I want to thank all of my collaborators at Penn State, UNC Chapel Hill, and New York University, the folks with Tools of the Mind, and appreciate the very generous funding from NICHD, the Institute of Education Sciences, and the Administration for Children and Families, and thank you for your time and attention. Our culture has always been sentimental about the mother-newborn bond, 
But as the next speaker's research shows, this bond has substantial implications for children's future health and behavior. Ruth Feldman is a professor in the Brain Research Center at Bar Alam University in Israel, as well as in the Department of Psychology there. She serves also as an adjunct professor at the Child Study Center at Yale University. She graduated from Hebrew, Union, uh, Hebrew University of uh, Jerusalem in 1994 with a PhD in psychology and did a postdoc at Yale University. Much of Ruth's research is focused on the postpartum period and how parental behavior during this critical time can influence brain development in profound ways, ways that have long-term implications, um, or impacts, or apparent impacts on children's cognition, behavior, and emotional growth. For example, she's established links among reduced maternal oxyto oxytocin levels postpartum um, depression in the development of anxiety, depression, and conduct disorders in very young children, a discovery that can inform interventions with an eye towards increasing mother's oxytocin. One of the most intriguing lines of research of Roost concerns the idea that mother-infant synchrony, the phenomenon in which a child will adjust her, his or her rhythms and movements to sync up with the mother during face-to-face -face interactions. Um, she, Ruth has posited that this process is key to the development of self-control and self-regulation in the child. She's found that higher synchrony between infant and mother um, co correlates with higher self-control as early as two years of age and predicts self-control across time. Ruth has been very prolific in his numerous publications, not only on oxytocin and synchrony, but other neurobiological processes, parents and parenting and infant functioning on a, a wide domain of aspects of uh, their behavior. Please welcome Ruth Feldman as she discusses the impact of postpartum period on the development of self-regulation and the implications of parental brain functioning for children's development. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure and honor to be here. I'll talk about regulation from a developmental perspective. Regulation is a construct that, that is a key construct in a systems model of the world. It defines how components of a system organize to accomplish life's function. I'll describe three lines in the development of regulation. That of the organism, or self-regulation. That of the organism context exchange, or synchrony. And the evolutionary timeline. I'll then use data from several longitudinal birth cohorts to detail the development of both self-regulation and synchrony, and use research on the parental brain to show how the three lines in the development of regulation converge. If I have a moment, I'd like to end by discussing the philosophical implications of the finding to the core question in neuroscience, that of the mind-brain polarity and the subjectivity gap. Let me begin with a poem by Wallace Stevens. In the punctual center of all circles, white stands truly. The circles nearest to it share its color, but less as they recede, impinged by difference and then by definition, as a tone defines itself and separates. And the circles quicken and crystal colors come and flare and bloom with his vast accumulation, stands and regards and repeats the primitive line. As the biological sciences became the lens to comprehend the universe, human no longer saw the world as representing hierarchical order or incremental progress for which a line would be the most fitted metaphor, to understanding the world in terms of systems for which the circle would be the most suited symbol. Systems or circles have several important features. They're not infinite, but self-contained. They grow from the core outward. They follow a finite set of rules and execute a predetermined series of programs, which, given adequate tools, can be studied already in their most embryonic forms. Systems, therefore, contain a sensitive period by definition and must include a developmental perspective, how color from the context mixes in with the white, and how the complex is superimposed upon the simples. 
Now, if system is the way we see the world and regulation is the operating mechanism of systems, the question is, can research on regulation shed further light on the three questions that guided human search for knowledge since antiquity, and every generation drafts a somewhat different answer to them. How the physical integrates with the mental, what it means to be human, and what is the life worth living. The three lines in the development of regulation, that of the organism maturation, that of the organism fittedness to the social ecology, and the evolutionary line that guided this process are interrelated and supported to some extent by the ancient oxytocin molecule. The oxytocin molecule evolved from an ancestral peptide via gene duplication in jawed fish approximately 600 million years ago uh, and is found in all vertebrate and some invertebrate species. The oxytocin system provides a very interesting example for the mutual influences between self-regulation and social synchrony. Across all species, from nematodes to humans, uh, oxytocin is implicated in the regulation of basic life function, such as thermoregulation, water balance, energy conservation, or gustatory function. However, within each species, those functions have been repurposed in the service of social life. And oxytocin became critically involved in social functions, such as parent-infant attachment, peer bonding, or social collaboration, in ways that support the social organization of that species. Interestingly, one of the most conserved expression of the oxytocin molecule due to its pulsatile release is repetitive rhythmic motifs of behavior. These are found in all species, from the courting dance of nematodes to the repetitive rhythmic synchronous interactions between human mothers and their infants. In several longitudinal studies, we try to detail the development of self-regulation from birth to adolescence. In the newborn period, regulation is expressed primarily in physiological support system. Uh, it implies a more balanced function of physiological systems that oscillate between on and off, such as heart rate variability or sleep-wake cyclicity, and state regulation that enables orientation to the world. Uh, in the first year of life, we exposed infants to paradigm that elicits stress. Emotion regulation implies the infant's ability to acquire a regulatory repertoire, maintain balance in the face of stress, and return to baseline following pert perturbation. In the second year of life, attention regulation kicks in. Infants are able to maintain focus on task, use goal-directed attention, and tolerate the frustration inherent in learning. At five to six years, we see early self-regulation, early self-concept, emerging morality, and self-restraint. Those give rise to a host of regulatory outcome at 14 years. Empathy, executive functions, the ability to manage stress and dialogue conflict, and lower behavior problems and accident proneness. We then wanted to say the mechanism that account for this continuity and found two types of mechanism. First, step-by-step -step continuity be between one, st one stage and the next, uh, implying that regulation evolves as the gradual acquisition of more complex skills uh, superimposed upon the old ones. However, above and beyond, we also found direct continuity from physiological regulation at birth to outcome at 14 years. This is very much consistent with dynamic system theory, which suggests that minor uh, variation in initial conditions are enhanced through repeated iteration, the famous butterfly effect. The second line in the development of regulation is that, is that of social synchrony. Biobehavioral synchrony is defined as the coordination of biology and behavior between affiliated members during social contact. It was coined about 100 years ago by the early entomologist in a, when they tried to describe collaboration among a group of ants. In humans, uh, coordination of behavior in the gaze, affect, vocal, and touch modalities provide a template for the coordination of physiological systems between two humans. We found that during moments of mother-infant interactive synchrony, there is also coupling of maternal and infant heart rhythm, coordinated release of oxytocin, and brain-to-brain -brain synchrony in alpha rhythms across the social brain. 
Here is the timeline of uh, synchrony. This is our longest longitudinal study, actually my PhD research. Uh, this is Maya. Besides the last picture is not her, she'll be coming in in a few months. And as you could see, the sensitive period in the development of synchrony is between birth and nine months, before social communication becomes centered on a verbal exchange. Then later on, abilities, uh, the, with the development of symbolic, narrative, and cognitive abilities, those abilities become superimposed on the nonverbal dialogue. And as to the rings of synchrony, we see that in the newborn stage, there is the parent expression of the species-specific human behavior in the gaze, affect, vocal, and touch modality. Uh, in the first year of life, these modalities become coordinated between parent and child. Uh, in the second year, parent and children start to get engaged in joint symbolic activity, which gain complexity and elaboration during the preschool years. Interestingly, those ability predicted the same amount, the same regulatory outcome at 14 years, and using the same mechanism, we found both step-by-step -step continuity in the development of synchrony, as well as direct continuity from synchrony during the sensitive period to outcome at 14 years. This lead us to question whether self-regulation and co-regulation of synchrony are really that distinct or perhaps just like the uh, particle wave uh, duality of the uncertainty principle, the difference represents more the uh, researcher's point of view than a uh, true schism. To test this hypothesis, we followed 127 parents and infants at seven time points from birth to 10 years, at birth, three, six, 12, 24, uh, months, five years, at 10 years. At birth, we measured physiological regulation by vagal tone and the Brazelton exam. At each uh, time point between three months and five years, uh, we observed and microcoded both self-regulation and parent-infant synchrony. And there were four regulatory outcomes at 10 years. Empathy, measured by dialogue and a lab paradigm, behavior problems, a maternal interview on child accident proneness, and vagal tone in response to stress. It was a tape of inter-adult anger. Uh, we found the two mechanisms I just described, continuity, step-by-step -step continuity in both self-regulation and synchrony leading from birth to 10 years. But we also found a mediated path related to the cross-time effect of self-regulation, unsynchrony, and vice versa. So that better self-regulation at one time point predicted better synchrony at the next time point, which led to higher self-regulation at the third time point, and vice versa. And this mediated path of cross-time effect of self-regulation, unsynchrony, uh, and vice versa mediated the link between initial physiological condition and regulatory outcome a, day, a decade later. Well, now that we saw that self-regulation and synchrony are interrelated, research on the parental brain shows that they're also integrated with the evolutionary timeline. Uh, interest in the neurobiology of parental care is a century old, but only the la in the last decade, researchers began to image the human parental brain. fMRI studies of parents' brain response to their infant's cues, typically cries, pictures, or sound, show several areas of activation which cohere into a global human parental caregiving network that consists of several interrelated networks. The first more consistently found network is a subcortical network that has been shown in rodent studied, studies to be critical for the expression of maternal care in female rodents. This includes the oxytocin-producing hypothalamus, the amygdala, and the subcortical dopamine reward circuit, both the uh, mesolimbic and nigrostriatal. However, unlike female rodents, in human, the ancient mammalian caregiving system is connected via multiple ascending and descending projector, projection to several cortical structures that are superimposed upon the ancient subcortical network. This includes the empathy network that enable parents to resonate with their infant's pain and feeling, uh, the mirror network that enable parents to represent infant action in their own brain, the mentalizing network that enable 
uh, parents to understand the infant nonverbal intention and the latest evolving emotion regulation network that enable multitasking, inhibition, and long-term planning. The fact that those multiple cortical structures are superimposed upon the ancient mammalian caregiving network gives rise to the hypothesis that perhaps those structures evolved in Homo sapiens in the context of parental care, which is obviously the most evolutionary salient context of survival. We next wanted to see how synchrony is implemented in the parental brain. We visited the home of 45 mothers. This is a study by Shira Tzil, and videotaped mother-infant interaction, microcoded it for synchrony, and used the interaction as the fMRI stimuli. We differentiated between two groups of mothers, synchronous mothers who uh, provide maternal behavior in accordance with the infant social signals and intrusive mothers who overstimulate the infant and disregard the infant signal for rest. A whole brain analysis showed only two areas that had differences between these two groups, and both load on the ancient mammalian caregiving networks. Uh, intrusive mothers had higher amygdala activation, and synchronous mothers had higher nucleus accumbens ac activation, a key structure in the dopamine reward system. We then wanted to see how these two subcortical structure functionally coupled with the cortical structure across the viewing of the interaction. So we use these two subcortical structures as key. We found that for the Synchronous mothers, nucleus accumbens activation was functionally coupled with areas in the mentalizing and empathy network. However, for the intrusive mothers, amygdala activation was functionally coupled with sensory motor areas. So it appears that synchrony is implemented in the brain by an underlying reward coloring which is functionally connected with cortical structures that enable uh, parents to resonate online with their infant need and understand his intentions. In the final study that I'll present, it's a longitudinal study by Ayala Vaham, we wanted to see how the regulation of the parent brain via parent child synchrony leads to the child emotion regulation outside the parenting context. So the regulation of one human via co-regulation between two humans lead to the regulation in a developing human. So we uh, recruited the 91 first-time parents, and we used the same uh, procedure I, previous, uh, I just described, uh, visited the home, filmed interaction, coded for synchrony, and used the interaction as fMRI stimuli. Uh, in this study, we were interested not only in level of activation, but also in network coherence, how structures within each network combined together to achieve life's function. Uh, at three years of age, we, sorry, we uh, visited the home again, and we uh, assessed infants in three emotion regulation paradigm. Sorry, okay. Something is wrong. Okay, let's try this. Uh, socialization was assessed with a toy pickup paradigm. The regulation of negative emotion was assessed with a scary mask paradigm. And the regulation of positive emotion was assessed with a uh, soap bubble play paradigm. And in these uh, paradigms, we coded both the expression of negative and positive emotions and the strategies to, uh, children use to regulate it. We found that uh, network coherence of the subcortical network, the ancient mammalian caregiving network, predicted the child's ability to regulate positive emotion. So children whose parents in infancy had greater coherence of the subcortical networks expressed more positive emotion and used interpersonal strategies to regulate the positive context. Coherence of the mirror empathy network predicted the regulation of negative emotions. 
uh, those infants, those children whose parents had better coherence in infancy, expressed less negative affect and used diversion strategy to regulate the negative context. And uh, coherence of the mentalizing network uh, predicted child socialization. These children had better regulation in the toy pickup paradigm. As to the mechanism, what we saw is parents whose brain was more regulated had more oxy higher level of oxytocin, expressed more synchrony, and this in turn predicted greater child regulation. The mechanism we didn't see is brain-to-brain -brain synchrony, which we think was likely in action here, so that more regulated parental brain via brain-to-brain -brain synchrony mechanism that are yet to be discovered uh, help shape a more regulated child brain. So to summarize, this is how we think the human parental brain sets in motion the cross-generation transmission of self-regulation and socialization. In the newborn period, the human parental brain shapes and is shaped by physical contact, breastfeeding, and investment. In the infant period, the human parental brain shapes and is shaped by oxytocin and synchrony. We know that these factors all predict better uh, emotion regulation and socialization in the childhood and adolescent years. In adult, we know from uh, retrospective studies, not yet prospective studies, that the human parental brain is associated with better memories of parental care in childhood and with oxytocin, which was shaped in the first week of life. So the human parental brain, which is the apex of the evolution process, not only builds more uh, self-regulated and socialized adult, it also sensitizes the adult brain to the most important function of evolutionary adaptation, the successful rearing of infants to become collaborative members of the human family. I don't have time to go into the philosophical implication. Let me just say that the subjectivity gap touches upon the question of whether what we learn about the human brain has any meaning to the human mind. And what I would like to suggest that perhaps this theoretical framework of biobehavioral synchrony, where we shift the focus from one brain activation to two brain coordination, may begin to chart the terrain and formulate the language to what uh, Gerald Edelman called uh, brain-based epistemology a field that addresses both the human brain and the human mind. Uh, I'd like to thank my student who carried out these studies and thank our funding agency and thank you for listening. Good is generally not something you want in your clams or between your toes, but according to our next speaker, a little grit might be good for the mind and one's future. Angela Duckworth is an associate professor in the Department of Psychology at the University of Pennsylvania. She completed her undergraduate studies in neurobiology at Harvard University in 1992 before hopping the pond to uh, University of Oxford for her master's degree in neuroscience. She, re she returned uh, to the United States to attend the University of Pennsylvania and obtained her master's degree there and her PhD in 2006. In between her master's degrees, Angela spent several years working as a math and science teacher, a role that would ultimately inform much of her research. In her classroom, she observed that intelligence and aptitude weren't always the most reliable of predict predictor of achievement in her students. Two other factors, Self-control and what she calls grit seemed to play a large role in how well children performed. Those who were able to regulate their behavior and put in sustained hard work over the long term tended to do better than those who got easily frustrated or couldn't seem to stay engaged in their studies. In her research, Angela set out to get an empirical 
uh, handle on what she saw in the classroom. And her initial studies have suggested that self-control and grit can have a profound impact on academic performance. She continues to refine methods for studying these constructs and examining how they relate to each other, how they develop, and how they can be cultivated. Angela's concepts are far from obscure. Her TED Talk on grit has been viewed over six million times. The MacArthur Foundation awarded her its prestigious fellowship, also known as the Genius Award, in 2003 just two years after she was highlighted as an APS rising star. Coincidence? You decide. Please join me in welcoming Angela Duckworth. Thank you. That was too kind of an introduction. Um, indeed, I, I do study grit. When, when Nancy gave me just one degree of freedom and said I could talk about uh, what I wanted to, I decided not to talk about grit because nobody ever asked me to come talk about self-control. But indeed, by the grant numbers and by the number of people, our lab works more on self-control than it does on grit. So um, the slides are, yes, the slides are there. OK, great. So um, I want to uh, say that I made this quote up in deference to uh, former APS president, Walter Michel. I believe I emailed him one day, and I said, Walter, can I say that you said that the most important scientific discovery about self-control is that it can be taught? And he wrote back, sure. Um, I, I think this is a, a, a relatively accurate statement of Walter does believe. Um, of course, the popular public knows now his, uh, his marshmallow test, which has been on the Colbert Report no fewer than three times, uh, if you add it all up. And um, I think that, that in some ways, the predictive power of the marshmallow test uh, belies, in a sense, um, the most important insight from Walter's decades of research, which is that in observing these young children wait for two marshmallows instead of one, they employed an array of ingenious strategies uh, in order to delay longer. And Walter's strong belief was that those strategies could be uh, directly taught and practiced. Um, in my own work on self-control, I, I beg, borrow, steal, I collaborate with whomever I can. And about four years ago, I met uh, the incomparable James Gross. And I'm guessing that about half of you are currently writing a paper with him, even at this moment, um, because, uh, because eventually everybody works with James Gross. But, but what really struck me ab about him um, uh, was that he was able to bring together so many disparate findings in self-regulation. Now, many of you know that James primarily works on grown-ups, and he primarily works on emotion regulation. But the model that he's developed in that realm, I think, has implications for unifying uh, more broadly what we would consider self-regulation or self-control. The process model says that impulses develop. So they begin, perhaps, quite weak, and then gather strength. And it is by intervening in the process of impulse generation earlier rather than later, then we can be really smart about how to exercise self-control uh, in our lives. And so I'll just take you through from situation selection, which is the earliest stage at which you can intervene, all the way through to response modulation, uh, what I mean. And let me illustrate with some data that James and our lab uh, collected recently from a local high school where we presented to uh, students from 9th through 12th grade a variety of examples of each of the five stages in the process model, which I'll describe to you um, uh, one by one. But I'll just say that when high school students read examples of modifying their situation versus using attention in a strategic way versus cognitively changing the way they think about things, uh, the striking finding is that students tell us that to choose your situation or change your situation in ways that are uh, very intentional, that's actually probably going to be much more effective than any of the later cognitive strategies. 
Um, so this indeed is the prediction of the process model that intervening earlier should be better than intervening later. I will say that we would have loved for the same students to tell us that each of the subsequent cognitive strategies would just be a little bit less effective, but data never cooperated exactly. So um, I think the gist of it is that the students have an intuition that intervening early is better than intervening later. Now the first thing that one can do according to James and the process model is to choose your situation, to choose where to be. Well, what, what do I mean by that? For example, all of the undergraduates who work in my lab take an oath that says that they will sit at the front of the classroom, the first three rows specifically. And I always get the same question, oh, do you mean in your class? No, nope, I don't mean in my class, I mean in all of your classes. Do you mean in the psychology classes? Nope, I mean in every single lecture that you attend. Of course, they want an explanation for this, and the explanation is that when I was in college, taking a class on ancient Chinese bronzes, I um, could do nothing more than just to sit in the front of the class to prevent myself from falling asleep for the entire lecture. Sitting in the front of the class is putting myself in a situation where social norms and pure shame would be working to my advantage to keep my attention on what I needed to do as opposed to something I'd rather be doing, napping, you know, reading, uh, you know, anything else, uh, versus the, the, the sort of the, you know, the nosebleed section. So you can do things like choose your physical situation. You can also choose to some extent your social situation. Recently we did a focus group of 10th and 5th graders at a school in New York City. Uh, tough neighborhood, schools were 100% free and reduced price lunch. And I listened to a 10th grader sagely advise the 5th grader, if I only knew when I was your age what I know now, I would have picked my friends differently because I got into the wrong crowd and you never can tell yourself how much your friends are really gonna influence you. So they're selecting your physical situation to advantage, going to the library instead of studying in a noisy house, uh, choosing to sit at the front of the class versus the back of the class, and you can choose your social situation to some extent. Uh, we think that uh, these are intuitive to students who, for example, in the same uh, data set that I uh, mentioned to you before, would, uh, when asked about, you know, what tell us about self-control in your own life and, and, and tell us a story about you had a, you know, something that you had to resist as a temptation and what you did. I'll just read two verbatim suggestions of students who in this open-ended prompt gave us things that we classified as being situation selection. So I would go to the library as being in a quiet and controlled environment would make me focus. I would lock myself in a room without my phone so that it does not become a distraction. Now, many students do not have the liberty or the logistical possibility of changing where they are. Um, and so we think that it's also important that they learn to modify their situation. And that is to say, once choosing where you are or having it foisted upon you, you can certainly change physical aspects of the situation. Now, Brian Wansick at Cornell University has a large number of studies that have shown that physical cues, like is the glass a tall glass or a short glass, is the soup bowl a big bowl or a small bowl, can dramatically influence eating behavior. And um, this is an example, we think, of situation modification if it's not Brian Wansink determining the size of your soup bowl, but you determining the size of your soup bowl. So we feel like this insight that physical cues matter can be harnessed by the individual to say, I'm gonna keep the cookies in my house in a cookie jar I can't see through. Unlike the cookie jar in my house, which like most cookie jars is clear um, and tempts me every time I walk by. In terms of students and academic success, which is really where my heart is, um, there is the simple modification of closing the laptop while you're sitting in lecture. Um, on the left, you have the typical scene of students with their laptops open you know, on eBay, uh, checking uh, their email accounts. Um, you know, I told my husband that this was generally true of professors who were lecturing in large classes, but not not in my class, where everybody was really just taking notes um, and paying rapt attention to me. So he um, went to my class and sat in the back row and took a picture of my class <laughs> and then um, pointed out to me that one in intrepid student was actually watching a full-length feature 
film uh, during the uh, hour and 20 minute lecture, which I thought was particularly humiliating. Um, I don't know for the student or for me, but anyway, it wasn't good. So, you know, minor technique. This is, of course, only if you as a student have a conflict, you both want to go onto Instagram and listen to Dr. Duckworth tell you what's on the final exam. And if you feel that listening to what's going to be on the final exam is, in the long run, probably a better use of your time, and yet you're pulled by Instagram. That's classic self-control conflict, and this uh, minor situational um, adjustment can actually just make it that much easier. Here are some verbatim suggestions of high school students. Quote, I would shut off my phone and put it under my pillow so I wouldn't be tempted by, uh, to touch it. Um, Quote, I would ask my mom to take away my phone and other distractions to make sure I can get it done on time. Now, um, I won't play this uh, clip. I'll just you know, fast forward. But I'll just say that um, we've been very inspired by uh, the behavior change work of folks like Carol Dweck and her kind of extended family, her progeny, folks like Reg Walton and David Yeager, who have shown that in very carefully crafted brief online interventions, you can have you know, reasonably large effects uh, on, on behavior change. So, so we picked up a bunch of tips from them, and we, we took the Brian Wansink research, and we created an intervention. We taught kids how to modify their situations. And um, I'll try to skip through the actual video. We tried to make it cool uh, and fun. And in a one-week longitudinal field study with high school students, at baseline, students were randomly assigned to one of three conditions. They learned about situation modification. They learned about a later strategy, response modulation, just kind of good old-fashioned willpower, don't do it. Um, and then finally, a no treatment control condition. Now, at baseline, in addition to getting um, uh, these you know, treatment assignments, students set an academic goal, which they then, one week later, were asked to report on. And in this data, you can see that self-reported goal accomplishment was higher in the situation modification group than either of the two comparison groups. We replicated this with a large sample of college students. Again, those who were given information about how they could use situation modification to meet their academic goals did better in doing so than two comparisons. And importantly, we found what we hypothesized, which is partial mediation. Well, we would have loved full mediation. Uh, but, but mediation, to some extent, by self-reported temptation during that week. In other words, students who learned to turn off their cell phones, put away their laptops when they were trying to read a book, et cetera, felt fewer feelings of temptation towards those other objects. And that at least partially explained the effect of the intervention on goal accomplishment. Now, I should say a word about these latter three strategies, but I'll be more brief because James and I don't believe that they're as effective as these you know, earlier upstream situational strategies. So first, there is selectively attending, looking at things in, in ways that you think will make it easier to do the right thing and harder to do the wrong one. So for example, at the KIPP charter schools, uh, and there are many of them in New York, but they're now all over the country, they have um, recognized from fairly early in their, um, in their establishment, these schools, but probably 10 or 15 years ago, they recognized that you know, for sure it's hard to pay attention to your teacher. It's hard to just look at your teacher when you'd rather look elsewhere. But they also recognized that by looking at your teacher, and I'll give you an example. This is a KIPP classroom. They're, they're all looking at the teacher. At, at KIPP, they call it tracking. It's tracking the teacher. That by accomplishing that, you then make it easier to do what's even harder, which is to truly you know, listen and encode and engage with the academic material. In other words, you can look out the window if you want to, and then it's going to be darn near impossible to pay attention at all or to process the, the history lesson. Or you can track the speaker, which they do at KIPP schools, and that facilitates you know, downstream regulation of the things that you need to do. So selectively attending, what does it look like when high school students explain they can you know, not look at their phone, ignore my phone, or they can direct their internal attention to things that are more useful in terms of regulation. Remind myself that even the most boring classes count towards my GPA. I will note that um, even though in Walter Michelle's early studies of the marshmallow, students, uh, I guess I should say four-year-olds, they're not students yet, children who selectively look at, way in, you know, at or uh, you know, objects that are not the marshmallow are able to wait longer. So selective attention, strategic attention emerges as one of the most important strategies in those early preschool studies. Notably, this was the least commonly 
um, nominated strategy among, among uh, high school students that we surveyed, which we haven't quite figured out why, but we, we note the, the disparity. Now, what do you do once you've chosen where you're gonna be, modified the situation or not, attended to what you've decided to attend to? You can, of course, change your mind. You can reframe or change the cognitive representation of the situation. There are many ways to do this, but one very important way relevant to self-control, self-regulation, is reconstruing the distance of the situation, psychological distancing. So in one random assignment study in collaboration with Ethan Cross, Kids at fifth grade were either chosen to replay an event of an angry memory as it unfolds in their own eyes, that's the first person immersed egocentric control condition, or alternatively in the intervention to replay the event as it unfolds as they observed their distant self, the third person, or most effectively, it's like you're in a YouTube video. Oh, okay, now I know what you mean. Okay, so this uh, is uh, very facilitative of emotion regulation, in particular, regulating the negative, the lingering negative emotions of that angry memory easier when you're seeing yourself in the third person, uh, like you are a fly in the wall in the situation versus from the first person egocentric perspective. I recently had an argument with my spouse and tried to do this. I was like, oh, okay, I'll do Angela Duckworth had an argument with her spouse. It didn't really work, actually. I was, um, you know, flooded with emotion, but we'll say this. I think that in general, the very exciting work on psychological distancing and reconstruel, you know, it opens up a whole doorway of things like just the very idea that the mental representation, that there's still some agency there, that, that there's still um, an opportunity there for us to regulate, yeah, I think is very important. Here are some verbatim suggestions of high school students. Quote, I would plan something for myself that I would only do if I got straight A's, so I would sort of, you know, think about pairing the, you know, the, the homework with, you know, later reward. Um, I would set goals, break the project up into pieces. Um, I will say this, and I know there's not opportunity for questions and discussion, categorizing what students, you know, in this open-ended um, uh, way would just tell us that they would do was very difficult and also made me realize some of the limitations of the process model, which have these five neat, you know, distinctions, but actually in reality end up being, um, you know, not uh, distinctions that are very well respected by high school students who tell us that they do, you know, more than one strategy at once or, you know, things that are hard to categorize, things that are kind of on the border. Um, so let me just tell you about the last stage, which doesn't need much telling at all, because this is really just good old fashioned, don't do it, or do do it, depending on what you're trying to. Um, as the Buddhists would say, and as the Buddhists would disrecommend, uh, this is simply crushing mind with mind, right? And I think, you know, just in um, thinking about the work that was presented earlier, in some ways, you know, this discussion of, you know, early self-regulation leading to sort of higher order, more sophisticated ways of regulation, I think of this as kind of, you know, executive function in its rawest form. Uh, there's almost no art or strategy to it at all. Uh, what does that look like if you're talking about high school students? Don't be a baby and just study. Just deal with it and study. Just do it. Just focus and get my work done. And we actually use the word just in our coding manual as a sign that really kids were, you know, you know talking about this last stage. Um, I want to end by saying that, you know, whatever strategy it is that you use to sit in the front of the lecture hall, to, um, you know, turn your phone off, to look at the teacher, not look out the window, to frame a situation in a particular way, it of course helps to do some advanced planning. And I think that the work of Gabrielle Ettingen and Peter Golwitzer could not be more influential for myself as a scientist, as, as well as, um, as uh, almost everybody that I know who works on behavior change. So I will just quickly say that their work uh, where students are encouraged in a very systematic way to set goals and to in advance plan how they uh, hope to act in a certain situation. So goal setting and goal planning um, seems to, for example, in our joint work, uh, in a random assignment, placebo-controlled, longitudinal field study over the course of half of an academic year, uh, it, this uh, brief intervention is able to improve 
GPA from school records, as well from school records, uh, school attendance, uh, you know, being on time, and uh, teachers who are blind to condition their ratings of classroom conduct uh, during that semester. It is not a miracle. So, for, you know, subsequently, uh, you know, behavior returns, and there's, uh, you know, the difference between the control group and the intervention group uh, erode to non-significance. But I do think it's really a promising direction uh, in, in order for us to put everything together that's known about these higher level metacognitive strategies. Uh, so, so all of the things that I talked about in the process model, can they get wrapped in a way in the kind of mental contrasting and implementation uh, intention work that Gabrielle and Peter are doing. And then finally, I will just say to expand the scope even uh, it, you know, broader than, than what I've tried to do already, I believe that there's a, a role for habit habit formation that has just begun uh, to get uh, you know, some traction on. In our work, we find that more self-controlled individuals, more self-controlled students in particular, have stronger study habits. They study at the same time every day. They study in the same place every day. My daughter is an exception to this. She feels like it's much better to wake up every day and decide on the spot what you're going to do and, and, and how you're going to do it um, in a more reactive way. And uh, you know, I'll show her this uh, figure when I get home, which is that more self-controlled kids tend to have these habits. And those habits mediate, to a large extent, the positive effects on self-control on things uh, like studying when things are difficult and also grades. And so let me um, end with this slide from, from William James. Uh, and in his classic work in 1899 said, virtues, virtues are habits as much as vices. Our nervous systems grow to the way in which they have been exercised, just as a sheet of paper, once creased or folded, tends to fall forever afterward into the same identical folds. So let the children learn the process model strategies and let them learn um, mental contrasting and implementation intentions. Let them learn the folds that we think will set them up uh, for success later in life. And thank you for your attention. Thank you, Nancy, for having me. I've really appreciated the opportunity. Thanks. Our next speaker tonight, our final speaker, is B.J. Casey, a developmental cognitive psychologist renowned for her use of innovative neuroimaging techniques to examine how brain systems develop, especially in adolescence. We saw her picture last night at the keynote. Uh, B.J. attended, uh, or shall I say, Betty Jo. <laughs> I learned that B.J. <laughs> stands for Betty Jo last night when BJ had a few drinks. Um, <laughs> BJ attended Appalachia State University starting at age 16, earning her bachelor's and master's degrees before moving to the University of South Carolina for her PhD completed in um, 1990 and then moving to NIMH for her postdoctoral studies. She currently serves as Sackler Professor of Developmental Psychobiology at the Weill Medical College of Cornell and is Director of the Sackler Institute for Developmental Psychobiology. BJ is considered a world leader in neuro, human neuroimaging and its use in examining typical and atypical development, focusing largely on the development of self-control. Her fMRI studies in the 1990s were among the first to use neuroimaging to examine brain development rather than brain, just brain functioning. Her developmental and translational studies across species highlight the need to treat the biological state of the developing rather than the developed brain. She also examines how things go awry in disorders that emerge in childhood and adolescence. BJ's models for typical and atypical development draw on insights from behavioral measures and functional and structural neuroimaging experience, uh, experiments, which she's been able to optimize for examining transitional periods of development, such as adolescence. BJ is a recipient of numerous awards, which I won't uh, enumerate because she wanted me to be short. <laughs> Please uh, join me in welcoming B.J. Casey. And so I should say thank you very much, Nancy or Madam President. And uh, while I'm setting up here, I would also like to uh, send a shout out to Alan Kraut and all that he has done for the society. I, and 
and I also, another shout out for the engaging presentation by Mike Posner last night to set the stage. Why not applaud again? And I applaud you for staying here and not having a cocktail, because I have to tell you, that's where I would be. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> thanks for applauding yourself. And so I'm now going to, um, to, to show you the most important slide I ever can put in a talk. And um, it's actually unnerving because I don't care how many people I put on this acknowledgement slide. Uh, I can look out there and see about 100 people I probably should have acknowledged in terms of informing our research and the work I'll talk about today. But I am going to be shameless and opportunistic. And in the next, um, hopefully, less than 20 minutes, I will um, present as much of my fellows' work in a, a hopefully a cohesive way, really focusing on how changes in development can impact self-control and considering that as a context itself. We all know that the um, adolescent brain and adolescent behavior has received a lot of attention from the media. I tend to refer to it as the media, media darling. And um, it's because we can really voyeuristically just open up that head and look at while the teenager is behaving and doing what they're doing and seeing how the brain activity is changing during that time. Now, too often, the way that we describe this period as if it is a brain that has no brakes, no steering wheel, and only an accelerator. And that's suggesting almost as if there's a hole in the head. But when you open it up and look in, it looks pretty close to an adult's brain. So what's important for us to try to understand is how this typical, and I'm going to suggest necessary stage of development, how there are changes in the brain that allow it to meet the many different challenges of the adolescent period, from physical, cognitive, sexual, and social. And um, we usually talk about this period as beginning right around the onset of puberty. But um, when we talk about the end, if the definition of adolescence is uh, the transition from being dependent on a parent to relative independence. Uh, many of us have discussed how our children may be in that period for a long, long time financially. But over the past decade, and trying to really look at brain and behavior uh, correlations and associations, um, we've been able to characterize the teenager as um, an individual who is incredibly sensitive to rewards, also sensitive to threats, social influences. Um, and we think it's a combination of these things that impact their degree of impulse or self-control and their risk-taking behavior. There have been at least three neurobiological models that have been put out there to try to explain the adolescent brain. Um, one of the first that Larry Steinberg talks a whole lot about uh, and his work is the dual model system. This suggests orthogonal hot cold systems that uh, presumably map onto a limbic system and a prefrontal region. And it's more value based. And then there is, uh, it's a lovely heuristic when you're talking to the media or you're trying to change policy. And then there's um, an elegant model where Monique Ernst and colleagues um, sort of tried to separate out aspects of that limbic system according to valence, linking positive and negative valence to the accumbens and the amygdala, respectively. And then we built on that work, and actually in the mid-2000s, came up with um, a model that we think is more circuit-based, largely based on work by Adriana Galvan at that time, looking at specific circuits and how regions within those circuits had differential patterns of development. And that's the imbalance model. Um, Sarah Jane Blakemore has recently published uh, a paper where she talks more about a mismatch in development of regions such as the um, amygdala and the accumbens too and prefrontal cortex. Um, this is uh, an interesting perspective to try to get away from an imbalance that I think some people think has a negative tone to it. I don't particularly, I'll, I'll try to unpack that. Um, but this is just talking about volume differences. And there's no room for the circuit or the connections um, to really change here. So let me just show you this little video where um, what we know from the non-human animal and um, human work 
is that there are a number of systematic changes in the limbic system, particularly subcortical systems, where you get strong local connections, you see peaks in neurochemicals like dopamine and neurotrophins and endocannabinoids as well. And you see that occurring before you see it in this green area in the prefrontal cortex. And so what our imbalance model suggests is during adolescence, with this regional development, you, um, you get this, this sort of imbalance when you're in the heat of the moment, where the uh, limbic systems tend to win out. And so it's not that the amygdala and the accumbens can't call or signal the prefrontal cortex. It's just that that system and the distal projections are not fully mature. So really, all these regions, um, if you're getting a projection in these subcortical systems, they're still developing. They're still forming those connections. And this is different from adults because this circuitry is mature. And it's also different, and this was what was so um, wonderful about Adriana's work. Not only did she show differences from adolescents to adults, which I'll um, show you in a moment, but also how these effects are adolescent specific and are not seen in children as well, which we think is because there's immaturity in ascending as well as the descending projections. Um, and in simplistic ways, we've talked about this building on John Cohen's sort of idea of the prefrontal cortex as vulcanization of the brain. And we talk about the imbalance of being on the Starship Enterprise. And you've got Mr. Spock, um, who is logical, and you have Captain Kirk, who is um, someone who has passion and he can show rage. And sometimes he flies by the seat of his pants. And when he does that, if they're on the bridge of the Starship Enterprise, that's when Spock is needed. So what I'm um, suggesting to you is it would make sense during this period of development that you would want regions to call a system that's going to help you regulate so that you no longer need your parent to be your self-regulation and you can do it on your own. This is very um, similar to learning uh, data, Earl Miller and many others, where they've shown changes in subcortical systems before prefrontal. So we're just suggesting it's a more protracted period during development. So how do I define self-control in the context of this symposium? Well, self-control is um, really our ability to suppress maladaptive thoughts, actions, desires, and emotions in favor of adaptive ones. And if we go back to how adolescence is characterized in the most recent work, really we're talking about aspects of self-control. And two different uh, descriptions come up of the adolescent uh, multiple times, as if they're synonymous. They're impulsive and they're risk-taking. And I wanna unpack that for you a little bit because really there are different developmental trajectories um, for risky behavior and impulsivity and uh, slightly different overlapping neural circuitries. The way we measure impulsivity in the laboratory, we can use an anti saccade task, a stop signal. We like to use a go-no-go -go task or whack the mole task. At this point, since you want a cocktail, I'm not gonna have you proceed in this task, but basically all these tasks do is they build up this habitual or prepotent response by having many targets that you're um, pressing to. In this case, the sneaky mold that keeps popping up in your garden that you don't want there, so you whack it. Um, I will tell you, in a psychiatry department, it was really nice to get them to say instead of whack, yes. And so you're hearing, yes, 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 every time the mold popped up. And people were trying to come in to see um, the excitement and enthusiasm was about in the psychiatry department. So what you don't want to do is mash a vegetable. And so basically, the mold can be tricky. You don't want to <laughs> press them. And you, def you want to press to him, but you don't want to press to the eggplant. So if I had each one of you perform this task, you would see that there would be individual uh, variability in your performance. I know some of you um, might be a little bit lower. And then if we looked across development, what you see is this ability is really emerging right around the late um, adolescent years, teenage years. Uh, but if we put these in neat little bar graphs, like we tend to do, you wouldn't see this variability. And you would basically see sort of a monotonic decrease in the number of times you whacked the mole um, when it was actually a vegetable and you should not have. Now, 
Um, we know from TMS studies and lesion studies in non-human primates that there are certain areas of the brain that make it more difficult for um, us to engage in impulse control. And when you perform these tasks in the scanner and you look at the pattern of brain activity, you basically see a region in the ventral lateral prefrontal cortex. And uh, the activity in this region, when you're correctly uh, able to engage in impulse control, correlates uh, with the actual performance. And we see across development that there's this monotonic decrease with age from childhood to adulthood. Notice children are activating this region more for the correct trials, and um, they're actually the same ones who are having the most difficulty on the task if you just look at their overall performance and the signal. But there is nothing adolescent-specific in these data. It's just continuing to uh, decline in terms of the amount of activity and the, and the number of errors. So now I just want to move to um, some of the work that brings in uh, reward, value, incentives, and how that drives our behavior. And this is really, again, focusing on the elegant work of Adriana Galvan, who, um, when she was doing her thesis, she got tired of people saying, adolescents do what they do because of the prefrontal cortex. And so she wanted to try to look at reward circuitry and decided to use a paradigm that Wolfram Schultz was using with his non-human primates when he looked at dopaminergic firing um, to those rewards. And she used a couple of paradigms. The one I'm going to talk about today is one in which you simply had three discrete stimuli. These are pirates. And unbeknownst to the subject, you uh, mapped uh, reward for those cues onto different amounts of money. Now, the task they had to do was simply to say what side of the screen the pirate was on, which is pretty easy to do. So even children can perform this at 95% accuracy. But what she saw in their performance, even without the subjects being able to articulate this, that when they saw a cue that later predicted a larger reward, reaction times got slower and slower. And even though they were getting a single coin, um, when they pressed to this queue, they got significantly slower. It's indeed relative. Now, in this task, when you place it in the scanner and you look at the pattern of activity, you're, the question is, what maps on to these differences in latencies? And un, not surprising to us is that uh, reward circuitry involving the orbital frontal cortex and the accumbens are showing monotonic increases as you increase the amount of reward the individual gets from small, medium, to large. And you see that in the orbital frontal cortex, too. But Adriana wanted to know, how does this change across development? Because at this point, people had shown differences between adolescents and adults, but we really didn't know what was going on with children. In this orbital frontal region, what we see is there is a decline in activity when you perform tasks like this as a function of age group. But the striking differences were in the accumbens, an area that's very important about learning about outcomes, too. And there was an exaggerated response in this region. Now, why is this relevant to adolescents and their behavior? Because the activity to uh, reward is actually correlated with the amount of uh, likelihood of engaging in risk taking. So activity to receipt of reward was then correlated with their self-reports of this risky tendencies. And we also know that when adults are about to make a risky decision, we see elevation in this region as well. So these were the data that led us to develop the imbalance model. And it was basically showing accumbens is beginning to um, asymptote before the prefrontal cortex. It's also the case that social influences can impact us. And I want to go back and sort of link social influences, just simple cues. Larry Steinberg showed just having a peer next to you can lead to um, you engaging in risky behavior. But I want to highlight work by uh, Leah Somerville, who is a postdoctoral fellow at the Sackler Institute. And basically, what Leah did was she examined the patterns of behavior and brain activity when instead of having a mole um, that you were um, whacking and trying to refrain from whacking the, uh, the produce that was appearing out of the ground, um, she used smiling social cues, smiling faces that were developed by NIMSTEM, uh, Nim Tottenham, who developed NIMSTEM, another fellow from the Sackler Institute. Told you I was going to get all these guys in. Um, and so what she showed is, 
When you ask adolescents not to press to a smiling face relative to a neutral one, that they can't stop themselves. They have a really difficult time not approaching that positive cue, and you're not seeing that pattern in children or adults. And if you look at the neural correlate of that, it's the same region that we see is elevated in the teen when they are receiving a large reward. So um, what I cannot do is have a talk about self-control and not highlight my work uh, with Walter Michel. So hold this in mind, and I want to talk about individual differences, and then I'll bring it right back to that. And that is, with Walter, um, we had this wonderful opportunity to look at his original cohort of children who had played the delay of gratification game, or marshmallow task, when they were four, and we brought them back when they were 40. We actually scanned them at Stanford in collaboration with Ian Gottlieb. And the question that we had is, are low delayers and high delayers are, they, um, are the low delay are simply impulsive? And so we can use tasks like the whack the mole to examine that. But what we did is we um, tested these uh, individuals in their mid-40s, and we broke them out into those individuals who um, over the years had looked like they were consistently low and others who looked like they were pretty consistently high delayers. And um, we had them perform the impulse control task where they had to stop and not press to a neutral expression versus having to stop themselves and um, not press to a smiling face. We use these social cues because marshmallows just don't do it for us when we're in our 40s. There are other things that um, we are very social beings. So the, um, the results for just the, the neutral or kind of cold version of the uh, go, no, go tasks showed no differences between these groups. But the minute you had this appetitive social positive cue those 40-year-olds who couldn't wait to get two marshmallows, in their mid-40s, they're having trouble waiting um, and stopping themselves when they see something pulling their attention, something that um, was alluded to earlier. And if you look at the neural correlates of this, overall, across the task, when you're performing the no-go trials, it's the case that low delayers are not activating this region um, in the prefrontal cortex as much as the high delayers, but um, the area that really discriminates them based on when their uh, performance is really faltering on those hot trials. Again, looking down on top of the brain, this is the axial image now. It's in this area in the nucleus accumbens. So just to summarize those findings for you, there are developmental and individual differences in self-control where adolescents show a heightened pull, multiple alarms to these um, positive social cues, and so do low layers. And the, um, the neural circuitry uh, is very similar across these. Um, the last um, uh, few minutes, I just want to talk about threats as well. And this is work by Michael Dreyfus, an MD-PhD student, reanalyzing um, data from Todd Hare's thesis. He's now at Zurich. And basically, all this is is examining how adolescents respond when you don't have a smiling face, but now you have a threat cue. That is, I don't think that this fearful face is scaring you right now, but we have learned over a lifetime that something bad or there's some uncertainty in what's going on around us. And so we orient to, to these as if there is potential danger. And using the same task and using these cues, we were surprised to see that teenagers look like they're drawn to danger. That is, they're reactive to these cues relative to neutral. So we always have that control baseline. And you don't see these pattern in children or adults at all. Now, we know from Todd Hare's earlier work that when you see these cues, that structure that I was talking about earlier, the accumbens, I mean, uh, the amygdala, is actually heightened in activity in adolescence when they're presented with these cues. And so that comes back to the circuitry that we talked about at the beginning of the task. No longer are we talking about valence-specific behavior, right, because we have positive and negative cues, but we're talking about an action-based, how you're approaching that information. And so part of what I didn't unpack in this circuitry is that, yes, there's signals to the prefrontal cortex, but there's this really interesting circuit um, that's a projection from the amygdala to the accumbens that Stuber has shown with optogenetics, if you activate it, it leads to approach behavior. And so with these local connections that we're suggesting are forming during adolescence, then what you get is more action-driven responses 
um, when the system is activated and you don't have the prefrontal cortex uh, projections uh, to inhibitory cells there to sort of blunt that effect. Aaron Heller, who um, just left the Sackler Institute for University of Miami, wanted to test this. So he looked at connectivity patterns based on um, a whole host of subjects we'd run on the emotional go-no-go across age. And he wanted to see if the strength of the connection between the amygdala incumbents was actually related to errors. And what he showed is the stronger the connectivity between these regions, the more false alarms that you get. But what was also interesting to bring it back to the prefrontal cortex so we can look at this little component, I'm really simplifying the circuitry tonight, is that um, the ventral uh, prefrontal cortex actually modulates this so that the stronger the projection from the prefrontal cortex to the amygdala, the fewer false alarms that you're making. And that did not hold when we looked at the prefrontal cortex to the accumbens. So these results suggest that adolescents are impulsive regardless of the valence of the, the cues during this time when we look at simple impulsivity tasks in the heat of the moment. We think that's driven by changes in the circuit locally before more distal uh, prefrontal systems can actually um, project to modulate those systems. Uh, and um, I just want to end this last minute and, um, and say that if it is the case that a region, a subcortical region, is still receiving prefrontal projections, then basically what we're saying is that's protracted development of that circuitry. And so Ali Cohen has been trying to understand when does the capacity for self-control and regulation mature? Because you're in New York State, a place where age of majority is 18, but you can charge and, um, and actually try uh, a 16 or 17 year old as an adult. So she, and there are also a lot of policies across the United States in terms of whether or not you're 18 or 21 in which you're deemed an adult. And so she has been using these same two tasks that I described and her basic question is, does a 18 to 21 year old look more like an adult on these tasks or look more like a teenager? And what she's shown is that 18 to 21 year olds do not differ from younger teenagers, but they do differ from older adults. Likewise, um, if it's a threat cue or if it's a smiling face. So these are things that we need to consider and are very relevant for policy. So on that, I'd just like to end and say, adolescence is usually described as this roller coaster ride of a lot of thrills, but actually they're thrills and fears. And it's important for those to have the opportunity to occur so that they can actually help rewire the system to help regulate um, these systems for moving forward and being able to engage in adaptive behavior that's necessary in adulthood. So thank you for your attention and for waiting this long.